All right, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Um, looks like we got a good good crowd uh, on the webinar. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gregory, and I'm the Executive Director of the Concrete uh, Sustainability Hub here at MIT. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be uh, giving today's webinar on uh, how to lower the embodied environmental impacts of cement and concrete. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping issues. We have everyone on mute because of the large number of people that we have um, participating to keep the background noise to a minimum. Um, but, but we very much welcome uh, questions and uh, that we'll be uh, answering later on in the webinar. Uh, if you look on your WebEx console, there should be a uh, button that allows you to do uh, enter in questions, and you can put it in that Q&A uh, portion, or um, you can also just do it in the uh, chat window as well if you can't find it. Either way, uh, we'll be reading those off and then answering them um, after we go through the, the uh, slide uh, portion of this. So, so I'll go ahead and um, get started, uh, and uh, I think the, the, one of the first things that I want to uh, bring up when it comes to looking at environmental impacts of concrete is actually, you know, it's important to remember that concrete is the most used building material in the world for good reason, and it's because it has a variety of attributes that make it uh, attractive. Uh, it's economical. You can use it in a relatively cost-effective manner. It's versatile. There's many different uh, functions that you can have from concrete durable, it lasts a long time, it's constructible, it can, there are many different ways that you can incorporate it uh, into construction, it's available all over the world, which is important for many people, uh, and it can also be made to be very uh, beautiful as well, which is attractive to many um, designers. And I think one of the neat things is that there's innovation that's happening in all of these different areas um, that's constantly changing these attributes and making it increasingly um, relevant. Uh, the other thing I think that's important is that we, we really need cement and concrete to meet a variety of different um, societal goals that we have. Um, uh, there's a, a set of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and we need it in order to meet those. We need it in order to address the affordable housing shortage and also to decrease costs from natural disasters. And I'll talk about uh, each one of these. First, when it comes to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you may or may not be familiar with these 17 goals that were created a few years ago by the United Nations about things that we really want to be focusing on, everything from uh, uh, eliminating uh, poverty um, to improving education. Uh, but you also see many that are in there about uh, uh, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, and sustainable cities and communities. Um, and there was a paper that examined the degree to which infrastructure either directly or indirectly influences these sustainable development goals. And they found that um, basically infrastructure did uh, directly or indirectly influence all of these goals, um, and in including there, there, are, there are targets within those, 169 targets across those goals, and 121 of them were um, uh, directly or indirectly influenced by um, infrastructure, and that's infrastructure writ broadly. So sometimes it can be electrical infrastructure, um, sometimes it can be about water, um, but but we know that um, cement and concrete play a critical role in those. So, so we're going to literally need that uh, in order to help us meet uh, sustainability goals. We hear a lot about um, uh, affordable housing shortages uh, across certainly the United States and in other parts of the world as well, and there are lots of different ideas for how we can um, uh, uh, alleviate this uh, housing shortage, but almost all of them involve building more housing. Uh, and so regardless of what type of construction we're using, we're going to need concrete for that. Um, the other thing that's on a lot of people's minds is costs due to uh, natural hazards, and those are significant. Uh, this is a chart showing where the 2018 billion dollar uh, weather and climate disasters took place, and there were $91 billion in estimated losses in 2018, which was the fourth highest after a few other more recent years. And there were the, the, the hurricanes highlighted in red, and also the western wildfires were the biggest contributors to those, and I think we expect a similar thing uh, to have to see in 2019. Once again, building more resilient buildings and infrastructure, it's going to require um, concrete in one way or the other. So, so we're, we're going to need this um, because society um, demands it, um, but 
a, a lot of um, what we hear in the news in, in particular about cement and concrete is their sustainability and it's often questioned. You know, we see headlines like concrete is the most destructive material on earth or that uh, the industry is, is failing us or we should just give up the use of concrete altogether. Um, and I think what often happens when you sort of look into the details of these is that there's confusion about the fact that we use so much concrete because it's demanded by the society, and that's often conflated with the impact of making it. And so I think it's important to start out actually decoupling the impact of producing the material from the volumes that we use. Um, because actually it turns out that on a per unit weight basis, concrete is actually a low impact um, material. This chart here is showing basically two different metrics for environmental impact. One is what we call the embodied carbon dioxide. So the amount of carbon dioxide associated with producing one kilogram of material. And the other is embodied energy. So just the energy required to produce it. So these, these are just two different metrics of an of environmental impact. And notice that this is a log scale, which means that here is, you know, 0 0.1, 1 is 10 times that, and then 10 is 10 times uh, well, 1. So we have to have that because it's such a wide range. These sort of bubbles here are meant to show uh, the range of different impacts we see across different categories. And what's interesting is that we see that concrete is in the, the, the lower left. It, it has a low embodied CO2 and embodied uh, energy on a per unit weight basis. So, um, so, so actually talking about concrete as a high impact material is, is just incorrect. What is true is that we do use a lot of it. As I mentioned earlier, it is the most used material um, in the world, and that certainly makes it worthy of us um, of discussion and trying to lower uh, its environmental impact. Now, um, one of the things that um, I really want to emphasize is that if we're going to be quantitative about these sustainability assessments, we, we really need a life cycle perspective, and we, and we need to look at um, trade-offs, trade-offs particularly among performance, cost, and uh, environmental impacts. And we, we need to remember that when we're, we're looking at the performance of a building or a pavement, it's because, you know, society has decided that this is some kind of function that, that we need, right? So, so we want to try and get the best performance we can from that, but then we need to look at um, environmental impacts and uh, cost uh, uh, using that life cycle perspective, and I'll talk about that a bit more. All right, so to, to basically when, what I want to do <clears throat> is, is show you a, a preview of, of what are the key takeaways from uh, this presentation. And the main one is really that concrete is actually a solution for helping us meet uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, and there are a couple key messages from within that. One, cement and concrete's uh, environmental impact can be lowered using technology that's available today. Two, captured carbon from industrial sources, whether that be power plants or other areas, that captured carbon can be used to create net zero or negative, uh, uh, carbon negative uh, concrete. Um, concrete uh, enables operational uh, carbon reductions and uh, it also absorbs carbon uh, over its, its, its life. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, uh, is take a little bit deeper dive into these issues and then um, we'll, we'll explain uh, what I mean by each of these things. The first thing to keep in mind is that, um, you, you know, a life cycle perspective should be used to evaluate concrete's environmental impact. We're, we're not just producing concrete uh, uh, because it's going to sit around. We're using it because um, we need uh, uh, buildings or bridges or, or pavements or, or uh, other kinds of uh, infrastructure. And because of that, because we're, we need that ultimate function, we need to look at how the material is used throughout its whole life. So, for example, if we want to lower environmental impacts, we can look at the materials production stage, uh, which means if there's a ways to use recycled materials, that could lower the environmental impact. Improving the energy efficiency of production can help as well, or the material performance. Um, in design and construction, if we can use less material, that can be helpful, or if we can create longer lasting designs, that can also reduce impact. Um, during what we call the use phase, if we can reduce uh, building energy consumption or reduce the damage from hazards, uh, increase the, the carbon uptake in our, our uh, structures, that can lower environmental impacts. And lastly, at end of life, uh, anything we can do to enable material recovery or also increase urban, 
carbon uptake can be helpful. Um, but we, we often will need to look at trade-offs among these different things. The key thing is that just because, for example, maybe we end up having to use a material that has a higher environmental impact, but if that allows us to then create those longer lasting designs or reduce building energy consumption, those are trade-offs that might be worthwhile. So we're going to take that um, life cycle perspective. What I'm going to talk about today is mostly what we call this embodied phase, which is really about the materials production and then um, uh, how much is used in design and construction. Um, and then I'll touch a little bit more on some other whole life related issues, although a lot of those will be touched upon in some of our um, future webinars here. So today I'm really going to focus more on this uh, uh, embodied phase. All right, so, so diving into this embodied phase, first I want to just give a little bit of background. Probably many of you know um, that, that concrete is really a mixture, uh, and it has these five basic constituents, coarse aggregates like, you know, gravel, fine aggregates like sand, some kind of binder, uh, water, and then admixtures, which are chemicals that can be used to uh, adjust the, the properties. So it looks um, pretty simple, but actually it turns out to be, a, a, it can be a pretty uh, complex um, process because there are many different performance requirements that um, we, we expect from concrete. Sometimes it's early strength. We, you know, concrete strengthens uh, uh, over a period of, of days, months, and sometimes years. Um, and so sometimes we need that strength to occur in a matter of a few days. Sometimes we're looking for it later. Stiffness, density, constructability. How well can you pump it sometimes or how fast is it going to uh, uh, harden so we can construct more on it? And of course, um, durability. So there's almost uh, sort of infinite combinations of different materials within these categories that we can use um, to, to meet these different performance requirements. Let me start with some of the binders. There are many different binders that can be used in concrete. Uh, Portland cement is probably the one that we hear about uh, the most, and uh, the name Portland really has to do with the mineral that was first used um, in uh, the United Kingdom from the Isle of Portland uh, that was the source of limestone. It doesn't have anything to do with Maine or um, Oregon cities. Um, but Portland cement is the one that's manufactured the most, um, and, I, and I'll get into a little bit more why that is. But there are are also uh, natural pozzolans that are available or calcined clays. Uh, these are other types of binders that can be used. Um, and then there are also different types of waste materials that can be used as well. Some of them are like fly ash from coal-fired um, power plants, granulated slag from uh, steel production, and even um, post-consumer glass that can be ground up and then um, used in, <coughs> in um, in, in, as a binder as well. The key thing um, is that, you know, the, the composition of these uh, and then how they affect that uh, performance of the concrete can vary, as can availability. Obviously, in some parts of the country, it's easier to get fly ash or slag than it is in others, and similar with these natural pozzolans and calcined clays. So we can't always just do a simple one-to-one replacement, uh, whereas this Portland cement can be manufactured in a very uh, specific and consistent way that allows us to have um, reliable properties of concrete. So we can use some of these others, but we often have to um, maybe adjust how we create those, those mixtures um, for the uh, concrete. Um, Another thing that I want to make sure that we think about is sort of, first of all, by mass, what's going into the concrete and then what impl implications that has on um, uh, the uh, environmental impact. So by mass, most of the concrete is, is aggregate, either gravel or sand. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, it's so economical and has a low environmental impact, because it's mostly just stuff we you know, dig out of the earth without really any transformation. So cement is about 13% in this mixture that doesn't have any <clears throat> supplementary cementitious materials where, some, where any of these other uh, materials besides cement, okay? So the fly, ash, slag, um, et cetera, okay? Um, but when we look at the environmental impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, so the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of creating this concrete, you see most of it comes from the uh, cement. And I'll talk a little bit more why that is. Um, <clears throat> but just important to differentiate what's in the concrete by mass and then what's in it by um, environmental impact there. All right, so this allows us to then take a look at a bit more um, when it comes to reducing the environmental impact, you know, really how far can we go? Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Architecture 2030 um, challenge 
which has said, you know, today can we reduce the environmental impacts, uh, the embodied environmental impacts of our building materials um, by 40 percent and then 45 percent by 2025 and then 50 percent by 2030 and eventually getting to zero embodied carbon emissions. Um, and this 2050 challenge, not only we see it here in Architecture 2030, structural engineers have a similar um, uh, a challenge and the idea is that we've been talking a lot about net zero energy consumption in buildings operationally. The question is, can we also do that in our materials as well? What does it even mean to have zero embodied carbon emissions in our building uh, materials? So, so let's talk about that uh, today. One of the things I want to do to start out is just frame a little bit and, and emphasize that there are many solutions available today for lowering cement and concrete um, environmental impact. On the cement side, um, there are different uh, alternative fuels and uh, improving the energy efficiency that can happen in the production of cement, and I'll talk about those a little bit, the, and, and also this clinker replacement. But there are ways that we can change the formulation of the cement. We can sequester carbon at the, the plant, and we can actually create cement products using captured carbon. On the concrete side, um, you know, I mentioned how cement really drives that environmental impact. So I think anything we can do to uh, replace cement in those mixtures can help. Um, I'll talk about how we can optimize mixtures using uh, different types of specifications, um, and also how we can uh, produce concrete with uh, and aggregates using uh, captured carbon. M many of these, so I'm, I'm going to describe these, but I just want to emphasize right now that many of them are in bold because they're things that can be done um, today, okay? Uh, but when so the, the, the key barriers to adopting more of these are often risk aversion and cost. And risk aversion means aversion by uh, people specifying concrete to use uh, different uh, mixtures or, or, or processes than what they've done in the past. And sometimes there's a, a cost implication for these things, um, but I intentionally put that risk aversion first because I think that's the bigger um, issue. So, so let me dive into some of these and explain them a little bit more, starting first with cement. And when it comes to, to starting, when it comes to talking about cement, I think it's important to first discuss a little bit about how um, cement is made. Um, basically, what we start is, is, you know, quarrying raw materials, which is primarily um, limestone. Uh, and it goes through this um, big facility where there's some crushing. Um, but a big thing that happens is that um, there's uh, heating that has to occur to this limestone. Um, and then it goes into a kiln where the temperature is, is 1,450 degrees C, uh, about 2,300 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so it gets very hot in here, <clears throat> uh, then it's cooled, and then there's some grinding that happens, okay? The, the product that comes out of the, um, the kiln here is called clinker, and it's sort of, a, it's this heated up uh, limestone um, that's sort of the size of like marbles or so, and so we, we grind it later on to turn it into a, a powder, okay? So this is uh, an energy intensive process because we have to um, heat up the uh, cement in order to get it, it, it heat up the kiln in order to get, get the cement to <clears throat> um, very high temperatures. Uh, and so there are emissions associated with uh, heating up the kiln. And also there's a chemical transformation that happens from the limestone uh, that goes from uh, calcium carbonate into clinker, which is uh, a calcium oxide, and that emits CO2 as part of that chemical um, process, okay? So when it comes to lowering the emissions associated with cement production, there's a few different levers that have been um, proposed. One is improving the, uh, the basically the, the thermal and electric efficiency of the whole plant, um, and that's certainly possible, although there's quite a bit of efforts already that, ha that have happened at these plants. Another is the use of alternative fuels to heat up the, uh, the, the, the kiln. Right now, because we get to such high temperatures, we generally use fossil fuels such as coal or natural gas, but it's possible to use waste materials like tires is a really big one, um, but, but any other sort of uh, uh, energy source that's a, a waste can often be used as well to substitute for those fossil fuels. 
Um, clinker substitution just means that at the end, the final product that we have, we can actually blend in some other uh, materials here in this uh, step eight that didn't have to be heat up and then and have um, the uh, emissions associated with that heat and also the chemical transformation. So sometimes um, that blending, it turns out we can just take some limestone uh, and blend it in here at the end, and, and that blended cement is actually called a Portland limestone cement and it has very um, similar uh, properties to a, a traditional cement. Um, so that's, that's certainly um, one option. There are other supplementary cementitious materials that we can blend in there as well. Um, and then the last big thing we can do is just carbon capture, which is something that, that is being discussed for many types of uh, industrial sources, where if we can capture that carbon directly at the plant and then put it to other use um, or, or sequestration and permanent storage, then that's an option as well. So um, the, the uh, Cement uh, Sustainability Initiative, which is a, a group of, of world uh, uh, cement uh, producers, uh, uh, did an analysis um, uh, by the International Energy Agency and the World Business Council on Sustainable Development that, that helped sponsor that initiative. And they looked at basically what, where do we need these emissions to, reductions to occur in order to meet what they call the two degrees Celsius uh, scenario in comparison to a reference technology um, scenario, okay? So for the, the global, the, the cumulative CO2 emissions take place, they found that the big ones that we really have to focus on are um, carbon capture or something else that hasn't been defined, followed by um, creating these blended cements where we have less clinker in them. There's some that we can do with alternative fuels and energy efficiency, but most of it is really going to have to ca come from that um, carbon capture. Now, this, the, in the U.S., the, the most prominent uh, blended cement that we have is this Portland limestone cement that I mentioned, um, but there are others that are um, available as well. So that's, that, that's, that's sort of the situation for cement. We have a lot of opportunities, but if we're really going to get serious about this, um, the big opportunities really have to come from uh, that carbon capture in, in particular. All right, now one of the things I want to turn to is actually ways in which we can use captured carbon in cement and concrete. Uh, and and th this is what allows us to have the biggest opportunities to create either net zero or carbon negative uh, materials. That is, materials that actually have a net sort of sequestration of carbon dioxide in them compared to their emissions. Um, and the way that this works is that uh, carbon can be captured from any source. It, you know, it could be from a cement plant, but it also could be from uh, uh, you know, just any kind of power plant or other industrial source. So we capture that CO2. Um, we need a source of, uh, of uh, an alkaline reactant, and sometimes that can be cement, but it can be a brine solution. It can be other kinds of waste. And then there's this process that it goes through called mineralization. Um, and this is basically like the same process that um, uh, seashells underwent millions of years ago um, to, to transform from sea seashells into the limestone that we mine now for our cement. But there have been many innovations to figure out how we, we drastically increase the speed of that process to then use many kind of construction materials. We can make binders, uh, we can make uh, uh, aggregates, uh, from it, uh, and then we can make uh, uh, products such as blocks, um, um, or we can actually use it in ready mix concrete. And these are examples of some companies that are currently doing this and have products available on the market. I think one of the interesting things about this, when we talk about carbon capture and, and use or sequestration, the, the sequestration that happens in this, this concrete is permanent. Uh, this mineralization process means that there is that sort of permanent um, transformation that, uh, that, that takes place. And one of the interesting things is that there are many different entities that are looking at if, if you know, in order to really meet these ambitious um, greenhouse gas reduction goals, we're, we're going to need to do carbon capture and then we're going to need to figure out what to do with it. Um, and what geologic sequestration where we inject the carbon dioxide into the ground has its, um, has its challenges because it can it can leak out, basically. So people are looking at other opportunities, and this is a study that was done by C2ES that looked at a variety of different potential uses of this captured carbon uh, to create other products. Uh, and you see they look at concrete, they looked at fuels, they looked at algae fuels, aggregates, 
uh, um, algae uh, agriculture, polymers, and chemicals. And what this chart is showing uh, on the y-axis here is global market size, so in terms of its value. And then the size of the circles are basically the amount of CO2 mitigation uh, potential. And this is really just within the next um, 10 years. So what's interesting that you see, and, and this, you see this in a couple other sources that have looked at this as well, and from a value standpoint, concrete by far is the biggest opportunity. And I, that just goes back to, to because of how much we make it. Um, whereas aggregates here is the largest in terms of CO2 mitigation potential. And once again, that's because we use aggregates a lot in concrete, but we use them for other things as well. Uh, uh, so, so there's big, big potential here for the use of this um, carbon dioxide in cement and concrete. All right, so now piecing these things together, there are many different strategies that we can use to create that sort of net zero uh, or even carbon negative uh, concrete. And, and I'm going to group them by these constituents that I mentioned earlier. Um, one thing we can do, it turns out, is just inject captured carbon directly into concrete mixtures. And as I mentioned, there are many uh, companies that are already doing that, uh, doing that now uh, through that and use it, leveraging that mineralization process. We can also create what they call these synthetic limestone aggregates from the captured carbon. So they, they are literally sort of growing aggregates um, using the, the captured carbon as one of those ingredients. And when it comes to binders, we have many different opportunities. There are those blended cements, including like the Portland limestone cement that I mentioned. We can use supplementary cementitious materials like uh, the <coughs> fly ash or the granulated uh, blast furnace slag. Um, there, are, there are some alternative cement formulations that we can use that have a lower CO2 intensity. Um, and we can also make binders from captured uh, carbon. And lastly, of course, if we just capture carbon when we're producing the sort of ordinary Portland cement, that's also an important option as well. Um, and lastly, these admixtures um, you know, it are, can be a really important way to, to improve the, the concrete performance. Uh, sometimes, for example, when we use supplementary cementitious materials, it, it can affect the, the, the time it takes to, um, for the concrete to reach its strength or it can affect its constructability. And these admixtures present sort of a unique opportunity to adjust the mixture of the performance uh, to, to get it back to what we would see with sort of a conventional um, uh, a concrete mixture. But I think what's clear is that really if we're going to really get to that negative level, we're going to have to use multiple strategies um, within here. And so meeting those goals is really going to require us to rethink um, the way that we, we create our uh, concrete mixtures. <clears throat> now, when we create those concrete mixtures, the way that the mixture is, is uh, determined how it's going to be used in a particular project um, is really dictated by specifications. And there's a couple different types of specifications that are used. One is the more conventional, what we call um, prescriptive specifications. Uh, and this is, it's sort of like there's a recipe for creating that concrete mixture that says it's pretty specific on exactly what kinds of materials you can and can't use. Um, and so, uh, it, um, but one of the benefits of this is that, you know, if, if, they, if the, those specifications are followed by a contractor and they can prove that, they can't be faulted if for some reason you don't get the kind of strength or stiffness or constructability that you're looking for. The alternative is what we call performance-based specifications. Um, and this instead says, what's the end result that you're looking for? And it doesn't specify exactly how that you um, get there. Um, uh, in, in, in this case, you need a contractor and a ready mix producer involved to help you achieve the result. And you also need testing and inspection to, to demonstrate um, that you have achieved that end result that you're um, uh, looking for, okay? Um, now, the, the National Ready Mix Concrete Association has been talking about these performance-based specifications and their benefits for a couple decades now, um, and they've also looked at what are some of the prescriptive requirements that are in um, uh, many specifications and how they they uh, limit the opportunities to reduce concrete environmental impact. So for example, many specifications restrict the amount of supplementary cementitious materials that you can use. Um, and as I mentioned, that's a key way that we kind of lower our environmental impact. 
Similarly, they specify a maximum water cement ratio or minimum cementitious contents. Um, <clears throat> so, so all of these things, uh, while in many cases could be well intended and have a particular performance um, objective that they're they're trying to affect, if you if you really went to more of a performance based approach, then um, um, you wouldn't need these prescriptive uh, requirements here um, to be uh, specified. So I think shifting to this, these more performance-based specifications, that's a key component of how we can spur innovation in these low-impact um, uh, uh, concretes and allows us, what we want to be able to do is how do we optimize the different ingredients right here for cost and environmental impact targets. Um, and now that sounds like a, a great goal, but it turns out that, that that that's a real sort of change in the paradigm of how concrete is usually specified. And so if we're going to transition to a more performance-based approach, we really need to have collaboration um, uh, uh, among um, architects, engineers, specifiers, the you know the contractors, the developers, and also the um, uh, customers as well, <clears throat> because they're going to have to plan and say, this is our objective, we're going to uh, mitigate risk by collaborating among one another, and, and there, there are many examples of how um, uh, that, that can be done. All right, so just wrapping up these uh, embodied impacts, the, 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 the recommendations for reducing these embodied impacts, <clears throat> really what we need to do is address these barriers of risk and cost. As I mentioned, there are many technologies that are already available to do this. It, it's more uh, addressing these issues is what we need. So first of all, I think you know, just asking for environmental footprints um, in, uh, in, in the specifications is a key component. A lot of times, um, uh, material producers just aren't asked to report their environmental impact, so they don't even know it, it themselves. Okay, um, then uh, and that you know people are aware of environmental product declarations, which are a way to um, report those environmental impacts. That's a key component. Um, the other thing is that performance-based specifications uh, for concrete, as I mentioned, you know that can really spur innovation in low carbon cement and um, concrete uh, mixtures. <clears throat> Um, the other thing, though, is that we're going to need really some support to get off the ground this carbon capture at cement plants um, and other industrial sources, and also, you know, some support for these more innovative low carbon technologies for cement, carbon, and um, aggregate production that use captured carbon. Because um, at, at least right now, for most of those, there is going to be um, a, a cost premium. But that's where we have all kinds of examples of governments or other entities stepping in to say, this is important, we want to support the development of this so that they can sort of move along that cost curve. So, so these first one about um, the, <clears throat> are, are about trying to mitigate uh, risk, and the other ones are more about uh, cost. Okay, so, but, but I think th those are the, that's the key direction we need to go to really uh, uh, move along lowering those embodied environmental impacts. Okay, so now moving on to more the whole life, and as I mentioned, we'll be talking about this more um, in, uh, in future webinars, but just I did want to touch a little bit upon that, um, you know, it's important to also look at how materials affect that um, use phase. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we've done some research that sh really shows that energy use dominates um, building life cycle uh, environmental impacts, and these are showing some studies we did where we looked at um, different types of buildings single-family, multi-family, and commercial buildings in a cold climate and a warm climate and of different types of uh, construction, concrete, wood, and steel. And what you see across all of them that, um, you know, that the, the, the orange part here is that embodied impact associated with materials and construction, whereas the blue is more the, the energy use over a 60-year lifespan. Um, and so, you know, concrete can be one of those ways that we really enable energy efficiency in a building design. And so, as I mentioned, even in cases where, you know, it might lead to a higher embodied impact, if that can really lead to lower life cycle impacts to those operational reductions, that's going to be important. And we have some similar examples of that in the, the pavement space and how pavements uh, affect uh, vehicle fuel consumption. So, so that's an important thing to uh, consider. Um, 
The other thing that's a little bit unique about um, concrete is that there there is carbon uptake that occurs in the concrete um, over its its lifetime, and this is just sort of a natural chemical process that occurs that's sort of related to what's going on with the mineralization when the concrete is formed. A lot of this happens in um, re reverse, and uh, it, you know it's it's a process called carbonation that uh, occurs, and people have been studying that for years um, because it, it can have um, some impacts on durability, but now people are looking at it as how do we, if we we can mitigate the impacts from the durability, how how do we how can we use this as a way to, um, uh, you know, also mitigate the impacts of uh, climate change. Um, and there was a study that was done recently where they looked at how much carbon uptake has occurred in carbonating cements, and so that can be cements that are used in concrete, but also um, used in mortars as well. And they looked at this, uh, a, a team looked at this globally, and what they did is they plotted um, the amount of carbon uptake that's occurred in uh, these materials since uh, 1930, um, and that's what's shown on this dashed green line right here. They then compared that with the um, this black line here, which is the amount of emissions associated with those process emissions that I mentioned from cement. So just the emissions associated with that chemical transformation from uh, uh, limestone to clinker, so not the emissions associated with the energy production. Um, because this is sort of a way of looking at that process in reverse, that calcination process that occurs in the cement production. And in net, they found there was net emissions you know, of this uh, six uh, gigatons. And um, so, so they estimated that about four and a half gigatons of, of carbon has been sequestered in these materials worldwide, which offsets about 43% of those process CO2 emissions. Now it turns out the factors that affect this rate really vary significantly because it depends on how much surface area you have exposed um, for the, the, the carbon to be absorbed, what kind of mixture is being used, and also what's the, uh, the, the, the climate. So that can vary quite a bit. But still, we, we've done some estimates. Here's an example of a building where we had a meeting recently at, at, at Yale, and you can see this Rudolph Hall has a lot of exposed um, concrete, uh, both inside and out. And so it makes for an interesting case on um, uh, how much uh, carbon dioxide uh, has been absorbed. And we, we estimated about 125 tons of carbon dioxide since 1963, which is, is equivalent to about 100 trees. So it's sort of a unique element of concrete you don't normally um, um, think about that we might be able to uh, really emphasize a bit more. Um, you know, lastly, it's a lot of people don't realize, but there's many applications for recycled concrete as well. Basically, at the end of its life, concrete can be crushed uh, into this recycled concrete aggregate, and about 150 million tons of recycled concrete are used in the U.S. annually, and it can be used in new concrete, but it can be used in asphalt, it can be used in a road base, it can be used in soil stabilization, so there's a lot of opportunities for that at, um, at end of life. So. So just to, um, to wrap things up, you know, once again, emphasizing my, my key messages here, you know, concrete really can be a solution for these greenhouse gas targets. Um, its environmental impact can be lowered using technology available today. Um, we have strategies that can be used, including uh, uh, using captured carbon to create uh, net zero or carbon negative concrete. Um, we see opportunities for concrete to enable uh, operational re uh, carbon reductions. Um, and also it can absorb um, carbon over its life. And I think, you know, concrete is actually really uniquely positioned to enable these reductions because we have so many different strategies to lower the embodied uh, carbon. If we use captured carbon, it really is permanently stored, uh, but it also can enable building energy efficiency and, and similar reductions in, in pavements. Um, we see significant opportunities for carbon uptake in concrete and use of recycled uh, concrete. But just like people are often <clears throat> framing uh, concrete as a problem because of how much we use, it's also, that's an opportunity. Because of the sheer scale of concrete and aggregate that we use, means there's significant opportunity for that uh, impact uh, as well. So, so with that, I'll um, wrap up. Here's a, a, a email address. If, if you want a copy of these slides or uh, to learn more about what we do, you can uh, check on our website or, or email us at this uh, address in order to get a copy of the slides. And um, with that, I think we'll turn it over to uh, some questions. And I'll ask uh, Andrew Logan, our uh, communications assistant, to help me with uh, reading um, any of the, the, the questions that may have uh, come in.
Sure. Yeah. So we've had a, a couple of comments just about the slot being available. And I think, as you said, that that will be happening. There's also going to be a recording uh, available of this whole webinar that'll be on our YouTube page probably around this afternoon. Um, but do people have any questions about the content of the uh, presentation at all or any future work? Feel free to write your, your questions in the lower right Q&A box. Sure. That'd be great. Maybe while that's happening, um, I could also mention that uh, you, you know a lot of these topics are being discussed um, beyond just sort of the realm of the typical you know architects, uh, engineers, and contractors. Um, I think within the building community in particular, this has been a big topic. Um, because they realize how much emphasis has been placed on the operational portion of buildings, which, you know, as I showed, is certainly the area where we want to <clears throat> focus our efforts. But these embodied efforts happen, you know, right away in the life cycle of a building uh, and are still pretty significant. And so that's why they've been shifting their attention. But now um, policymakers are talking about this. We see a lot about it in the, uh, the, the, the press as well. So I think we're, um, moving on to um, some other uh, areas where we see this interest uh, as well. Um, so we do have a set of questions here. Um, okay. So one, of the, one question is, um, are you familiar with the sustainability assessment framework or tool that is reliable in terms of um, use in the whole life cycle of concrete? Um, so doing life cycle assessments uh, that involve concrete really have to be done on a product basis. So you need um, uh, like a life cycle assessment tool for buildings or for um, pavements. And um, th there are, there's, there's a lot of data that's available on how you can estimate the environmental impact of, um, of just the materials themselves, but doing a whole, whole building and whole life uh, assessment is still, um, I'd say is a bit more specialized. A big reason for that is that there are, for example, in the buildings arena, there are tools that can be used to estimate um, the life cycle impact of the embodied impacts of a building. So for example, there's a tally, there's Athena, there's one click um, uh, among others. And those, those can all be used to estimate that embodied impact of buildings. But as we saw, um, <clears throat> the operational component is usually considered uh, separately uh, by other people. And so integrating those together in a straightforward way is actually one of our research uh, uh, um, um, projects to try and do that. On the uh, pavement side, um, similarly, there's an Athena tool that can be used to estimate embodied impacts of pavements uh, with some of uh, the use phase uh, as well. And so certainly that's a, a good start. And I'd say for if it's really exploratory type questions, then those are, are, are great places to start to be able to evaluate some of these from a life cycle um, perspective. While in the meantime, there's a lot of efforts we're involved with to try to get some more robust tools that really can do the whole life cycle. Great. So here's one more question um, by David Walsh. When designing a building for carbon up, uptake by or update by mature concrete, what should teams be looking for? Maximizing the co finished concrete surface areas exposed to the air? Do sealers hinder uptake? How do mixes need to change to be effective uptakers of CO2? Yeah, um, it, it's a interesting question, and I think that it it goes back to our, our what I framed originally about trade offs. Um, like, actually, the best way to uh, increase the amount of carbon uptake is, particularly in what we see at concrete at end of life, is to demolish it and then spread it out because that really increases the surface area. But obviously, we're we're not going to do that for concrete that we need to use for buildings or pavements. So, exposed surface area is definitely a priority, and not putting coatings on it um, as well will also really help because like paint and things on top of the concrete, that certainly um, affect it. As the specifics around um, the mixture, um, um, I, I actually don't know off the top of my head exactly what are the things that we want to be able um, uh, to do in order to make that happen, but I, <clears throat> I have some references that talk about that a bit more. Um, but I think the key thing is, let, let's say we can design this mixture to increase uh, uptake. We obviously then still have to look at how does that affect things like durability and how that, that uh, you know, affect the potential for rebar corrosion and things like that. And so, so, but taking, looking at, at that system level, that's also sort of a, a, a research area for us as well. How do we estimate th this carbonation that can occur um, in a specific context and then look at those trade-offs with uh, performance? And on this topic of carbonation, another question um, is, is asking, 
Um, basically, carbonation is often a concern because of embedded steel reinforcements, and that is nearly inevitable in any large placement. How can extensive carbon uptake and steel corrosion be reconciled? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point. And as I said, that's why this this topic is actually there's a lot of research on it because it has been such a concern for um, durability. <clears throat> and that's precisely what I meant in my response that we have to look at those trade offs. If we are like like corrosion with rebar is an important if you use sort of traditional um, uh, concrete reinforcing steel. But there are many different solutions that would. Uh, uh, prevent any kind of corrosion there, whether it's epoxy coated um, uh, uh, <clears throat> rebar or um, uh, or stainless steel. So it could be just that we decide w in order to increase this carbon uptake, we're going to actually have to change the way that we do our reinforcement so that the um, the we, we alleviate any of those uh, type of uh, durability concerns. But but that obviously is going to have some cost uh, implications and. But if we're if we're serious about trying to mitigate impacts of climate change, those are the types of things that we might be have to be willing to do. Uh, so one more question is: um, um, Someone wanted you to comment on the use of EPDs by government officials trying to lower CO2 emissions when comparing products. Um, so for ex for example, can e EPDs be used to compare products like concrete, wood, asphalt, um, et cetera? Sure, sure, yeah. So, um, in environmental product declarations, they're basically uh, a life cycle assessment of a uh, construction product, in this case, that's been done to say, what's the impact of, for the, the scope of what we call cradle to gate, meaning extracting the materials from the earth and then to a manufacturing gate. So, in this case, it's like producing the concrete and then putting it on a ready mix truck, okay? Um, and so an environmental product declaration is like that, like a nutrition label that tells you what's the environmental impact of all that happening. And they were, um, the, the, the thing that's really gotten them off the ground is, um, <clears throat> is actually uh, the lead uh, green building standard. Um, because uh, in, in that case, basically, you're able to get points for using a product uh, in uh, that has an EPD in your um, building project. And so, um, so, so that's great because the intention behind that was to get uh, companies to start measuring the environmental impact of their uh, products. However, they weren't intended for the use in comparisons among different products um, because there are slight differences in how they can be done and certainly not across different material types. Um, because the, the functional unit for comparison is usually just like on a per weight or volume basis. And so like the amount of concrete or steel or wood used on a project would, would vary. You have to do that on sort of the design basis. And so, um, so it really, the, the EPDs are not really set up right now in order to do those types of uh, comparisons in a procurement type manner. I certainly think that there are opportunities to either change the EPDs or just use a whole different format um, altogether in order to incorporate environmental impact into um, procurement type decisions. <clears throat> but that current EPD framework, because it's mostly geared towards these lead credits, it's not really set up by itself um, to make those procurement uh, decisions. And so there's uh, one question about um, some of the, the low Lombardi carbon technologies for ready mixed concrete. And the, the question specifically is over the, the, the near term, the short term, approximately five years, and then the longer term, um, 20 years plus, what technologies um, and initiatives are most promising to lower uh, the embodied uh, carbon of, of concrete, ready mixed concrete? Yeah, um, so I think that the ones that are most likely to have an immediate impact are just changing your mixtures to use uh, either more blended cements, such as that Portland limestone cement, or supplementary cementitious materials. And the reason I say that is because we already do that. Uh, there are many instances of that being done uh, successfully. So that's kind of the, the easiest thing. Um, <clears throat> there's a larger potential for reductions if we can use some of these uh, technologies technologies that have the uh, captured carbon. So first of all, let me say, so that changing the mixture, that will have immediate short-term impact in the, 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 like within the five years. Um, within the, the sort of the 10-year the timeframe, there is certainly a lot of opportunity for this use of captured carbon 
in um, concrete, either directly in the concrete mixture um, for ready mix concrete or blocks. And I mentioned there are some companies that are, are already creating products that can be used. Um, right now, they, they, some of them in some cases have a cost premium. Uh, uh, they don't always have to have that um, because of how the process works out. So that might be a bit of a barrier. It's also that sort of risk aversion that I mentioned. So I see that a bit more on the, the 10 year horizon. Um, but, but like I showed, when it comes to making the most use of captured carbon, we really have to shift to those um, aggregates. And there are a couple companies that are also in the early phases that have demonstrated this can be done, but they really just don't have the scale yet of production to be able to uh, get those biggest impacts. So I think even though the technology can be done today, scaling it up might take a little while longer, and that's why I put the, the sort of the aggregates more on that sort of 10-year or more um, time frame to really have the, the, the biggest impact. Uh, one more question is, um, is MIT working on a tool to optimize performance strategies, strategies versus costs? Um, for example, you know, LCA and LCC of various mixed designs. Um, yes, actually, we just got some funding from the MIT Watson, um, uh, MIT, IBM, Watson AI lab. Um, and basically the, the reason why we're looking at using machine learning techniques <clears throat> is because it's really, uh, it's, it's just a great opportunity for this optimization uh, uh, to be applied to look at how do we look at these trade-offs between performance costs and environmental impact in um, the mixtures. And uh, one of the, the, in the approach that we're using, we're looking at data on existing mixtures, but we're also incorporating some material science that we know um, related to uh, uh, binders that aren't conventionally used, where maybe we don't have a lot of uh, data on them. So I think that's going to be um, an exciting project that really allows us to look at that optimization um, a bit more, and then that could be something that could be coupled with performance-based specifications to really uh, lower the uh, embodied impacts of, um, of concrete. Um, and I think maybe um, one final question here, because there's, there's quite a few, and we've, we've already answered quite a bit, um, is, I understand, here's the, the question verbatim. I understand that ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete can lower CO2 emissions. Is this a viable alternate construction material? Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the real way that it lowers emissions is just by having to use less concrete. Um, and so uh, that concrete though, on a per unit weight basis is uh, more expensive because you have the fibers in it. But if you can design it so you end up using less on the project, then that's certainly a viable um, al al alternative. So I think it's, it's a great example, <clears throat> sort of going back to my whole life cycle perspective, you may have a material that has a higher uh, environmental impact on a per unit weight basis, but when you look at it across the whole design, um, it could uh, lead to lower uh, uh, embodied impacts on the whole project. And so, so that's a, a good example. It doesn't necessarily, you, you don't necessarily have to use a quote green material in order to have a quote green project um, because it's really the, the, the design is an important part of that. All right. So is that it, Andrew? Uh, yeah, there's there's uh, probably far too many questions to answer right okay. now. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, for for those for for questions that we didn't get to uh, right now, um, as I, I mentioned, you can feel free to send us an email. Um, that's also where you can get the slides. And like Andrew mentioned, we'll have a uh, uh, recording of this also on our um, YouTube channel in case you uh, missed it. And we look forward to continuing this discussion with many of you. I hope you'll turn in to, tune in to our uh, future webinars where we'll get into some of the operational uh, phases of this a bit more and some of our uh, other research. So, so please stay engaged. Thank you and have a nice day.